You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. We've got a great guest on uh, today's episode. Thanks, everybody, for listening uh, to the show. Uh, it's been a, a lot of fun. Uh, I sound like I'm. It's, it's the end. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, this is <laughs> this it. it. Uh, now I'm going to keep doing this as long as you guys are listening. And if you came here to listen to Dax today, I hope you'll at least subscribe. And if you like the show and you like uh, me interviewing people, then hopefully you'll uh, tune in and subscribe. And uh, you know, I'd appreciate you giving the show another chance. Uh, what's our handles? Uh, at Inside of You Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, and at Inside of You Pod on Twitter. Um, and then you can also leave messages, which it takes a while, but, um, hello at inside of you podcast.com and you can leave messages. So, um, it's been a crazy week. Uh, I've been watching that show. I told you the vow, right. And we're going to be having a guest coming up soon. Uh, it's incredible. So tune in cause then you'll know a little something. And I, you know, my interviews, you never really have to know the person anyway. I kind of put things in layman's terms and get to know them and. But uh, it's uh, that show is just you know. Have you been watching it? Uh, I, I started to because we're going to talk to that person soon. Um, yes. But uh, yeah, I've, I've only got five minutes in, and it's already I'm already scared. Yeah. You can kind of tell, like I mean, from from our perspective, from outside, you can already tell from the beginning, like this is not good. Well, it's funny you say that because you know when I first started watching it, <laughs> I go, I could do this. I could have joined this. The first episode, I'm like. I could use some more self-esteem. I could use some confidence. I could try to get out of my head. It seemed like it was a healthy thing. Yeah. And then everything just turns to hell. Yeah. I mean, it goes to hell really quickly. And uh, anyway, we'll get into that another time. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us. And a shout out. We had to stage it. And uh, Rob and I played music. We, we actually recorded at Capitol Records this last week. 11 songs. I want to thank the boys. Uh, Billy and and uh, Billy Duran and um, Moran. I said Duran, Billy Duran, Billy Moran and and Rob Humphreys and Joel and Zach and we had a great time at Capitol Records uh, recording our new album, recording me and Danson's new album. But we had to stage it on Saturday and we played live music and everybody came and showed up and I want to give a shout out to the winners from the the stage it before that we didn't give a shout out to and that's Team Rogue Flask and Leah and Kristen. Leah and Kristen, who are the top bidders, and Team Rogue Flask. Thank you guys so much for uh, being on there and supporting uh, the music. Dax Shepard's on today, and uh, I will say this. Um, you know, I text him, and I said, hey, listen, we did this interview, and then all this stuff happened with the relapse thing with the pills. And do uh, you want to say anything? He's like, ah, you know, I pretty much said everything, you know, in, in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. And I, and I get that. It's not like... But I just want to say, as someone who's known Dax for, I mean, before, I mean, just, you know, it was before he really was doing anything, he was on um, Punked. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he had, he was, I knew him when he was drinking heavily and doing a lot of drugs. And we both did some stuff. And, uh, but, you know, he couldn't stop. And so fast forward, he's got this nice family. Uh, he's a good dad. He's a good husband. Um, we're not perfect. We're not effing perfect. I'm the the example of that, the spitting image of uh, imperfection. But, uh, you know, he had a little relapse, which I was surprised. I had to hear about it in the news. I, I you know, I think because he started talking about it on his show. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was one of those things where he had an injury and then he thought it was okay. A friend gave him some pills and it was this. And then it sort of perpetuated. It sort of... Uh, you know, that his dad was dying and they had a lot of friction, although a lot of love for each other, but they had nothing in common. And the only thing that they did have in common was uh, addiction. And so they both popped a Percocet one night and just stared at the lake. And, um, you know, you do things because you feel an emptiness or you want to feel a connection or you want to feel something or maybe you don't want to feel something. It is the way that way of looking at it. And I know about that. But, you know, he uh, confronted his wife, Kristen Bell, about it. And Kristen, of course, is, you know, cool as shit. She's like, well, you know what? You were fucked up from the accident. You were, you know, then your dad and your dad was dying. And, you know, so, but like, let's call someone. Let's get this going. And um, I think what we do and, you know, I mean, we're all addicts to some extent, right? I, I believe that. I think we're all addicted to something. Um, 
you know, I feel like, you know, I was just, today's my first day without cigarettes. I'm quitting as of today. So oh, good. yeah, yeah. I'm trying to get rid of that, but we make excuses. Like I'm just going to do two. It's okay. It's because I had the surgery. It's going to be two or it's going to, I'm just taking one today. What's the big deal? It's not, you start making these excuses for yourself. And, uh, I just think it's really brave for, for Dax to, uh, just come out with it and say, I'm done. Because if it was so little and you were kind of doing it throughout, maybe you, you just felt like he kept lying to, you know, he was just not being honest about it. And he, he, he used the word shady. He used the word shady. He was like, I was being fucking shady. So, you know, I got to say that uh, it's very hard to say, you know, this is, this is what I was doing. This is how I feel about myself and being honest with it. So mm-hmm. kudos to you, brother, for uh, stepping up and, uh, I love you, and I, and I I'm, I'm I'm proud of you. Um, and Dax and I have had a pretty crazy relationship. I mean, you know, we it's definitely one of those things where it's love, and it's just you know, there's definitely a we really enjoy each other, and there's also been those moments where we're like, well, fuck you, man. We'll suck a dick, man. Well, fuck you. I don't need this shit. You know, like whoa, like you know, we've had a couple moments, but we're honest with each other. We kind of just like say what we have to say. And if one of us don't let we work it out. Mm-hmm. And, um, I just want to say, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, uh, that he's, uh, he confronted his, his shit and I need to confront my shit a little more. I, I, you know, I think we all do. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so thanks for, uh, doing that shit boy. Uh, we're going about to get in this, uh, let you know that there's some cool inside of you wine glasses on the inside of you store. Uh, new wine glasses and new mugs and a bunch of shit on there. So go to the Inside You Online store. Um, and patrons, thank you so much for continue, continue, continual yeah. support mm-hmm. or continuing to support the show. <laughs> Just keep digging. Jeez, man. It's been a rough morning, but uh, everything else is uh, everything's good. All right. Uh, let's get into Dak Shepard. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You. Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of you with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. I've never, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I've never heard someone sound so good or so clear. Your setup is really good, Dax. Oh, you're just saying in general on the podcast? Well, yes, I've listened and your voice is, it's, <laughs> it's crisp. It's refreshing. It's like a uh, Nest tea. You remember the uh, drink, the Nest tea? What's the immediate feeling you're having right now? Because I'm having an immediate feeling. Uh, a, a little um, excited, a little yeah. anxious, but excited. Well, like I'm immediately going like, oh, my God, I miss Rosenbaum so much. Every time I see him, I love talking to him. Uh, why has it been this long? Uh, which is the nature of life. I don't think anyone's at fault, but I'm just, I'm immediately delighted to be seeing you. I know I'm going to have fun. (laughs) I can't find my nicotine, which is going to be a big, big ordeal. It's funny. That was was one of my questions, by the way, today. (laughs) Still on the nicotine, still doing the Nicorette, still doing it. Oh, but I mean, I mean, it's way worse than that. I've been, I've been dipping for now, like six months, I guess. Just no, not that long. Cause I quit. On New Year's for a month or two, I don't know. Yeah, I'm on it. You know, I mean, I could lie. I could lie and tell you I'm not, but I am. Does, does that mean? Because <laughs> you quit smoking, you quit drinking, all that into what? Oh four. It's been a long time. Yeah, I quit drinking in oh four. I quit smoking in oh five. So I'm 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 on fifteen years of no smoky. Uh, but but I've been on the nicotine mints for. Uh, 13 of those 15 years, I was off for a couple of years entirely. And then I found, I literally, I found four mints in a fucking nightstand. And I told Kristen, I'm going to have, I'm going to have these. It's been two years. I'm just going to have one tonight. I'm going to have one tomorrow night. And then of course, three days later, I was at a CVS buying like 128 pack of the lozenges. <laughs> My God. Do you still dream of darts? No, I, you know, I have zero interest in smoking, thank God. Uh, it, it, something clicked on the last time. I had quit a bunch of times, but I knew it like something changed when like I'd see someone really cool, uh, uh, an actor I like smoking sure. in a movie, and it didn't oh, yeah. even appeal to me then. I was like, once it hit me, like, how absurd. You, you're going to fill these fleshy little membranes full of smoke. 
it's crazy. Like you, you should hope to only put the purest air in those things and just to fill them to the <laughs> brim with smoke. All of a sudden, it finally occurred to me how crazy that is. But how, how does it finally occur? Because for me, it, it has occurred many times. I know what I'm doing when I'm doing it. You know it's not a good thing, and yet you do it. That's part of addiction, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Going, yeah, uh, whatever consequence there is on the other side of this, my immediate desire to regulate my emotions <laughs> uh, supersedes that. Well, this, you know, for me, it was like, especially in the beginning, I was like, well, this is post-apocalyptic. This is, this, oh. I have every right to have a cigarette. Who's yeah, going to care? Could be the end. Could be the end. I'm going to have a smoke. Yeah. Well, and then ironically, it turns out heavy nicotine use is is, is um, preventing people from getting COVID. Have you read those in the no. New York Times? Yeah. <laughs> There's a like disproportionately low mem number of people with COVID that are smokers and nicotine users. There's something about it that has reduced its ability to to anchor itself into your bod. I just love how sometimes the way you speak, I'm going to have myself a little sip of this. Oh, what do you got a lacrosse? This is a green tea ginseng. Is that an Arizona iced tea? Yeah, it is. They're not a sponsor, oh by the way. Oh my goodness. Good for you. Is what that a blast bad for from me? the past. Is that bad? I have to imagine. Look at the can. Tell me how many grams of sugar and I then can't. times it by however many doses. I can't read it. My guys are not that good. Can't. I have contacts and I still can't read it. You can't read the side of a can. No, I can't read the side of a can. Is that so frustrating? It is. In fact, um, what I had to do while you were taking a dump is I had to uh, go and if I had some questions and I just I, I b had a bigger font. <laughs> well, yeah, what do you so great? Look, here's my list of questions from my last interview that I just got off of. And, Big and font. I, go I go 15. And then if it's a point I really can't miss, like the name of their book, I pop it up to 18. Hold on. Everyone what what number are you on? I'm, first of all, I'm, if you see me looking, I just have to make sure it's still recording because I'm doing this oh, by Jesus. my And there's a lot you of stuff like on it. OCD thing with the recorder? Well, you know, it happened once. I was talking to someone. I was like, oh, my God, that is the best story. Holy shit. <laughs> Can you repeat <laughs> yeah. that amazing story? <laughs> As if it's the first time you've ever told it to me. And what's funny is that was the one story they wanted cut. Oh, yeah, it was a good yeah. story, but I had to respect it. You know, it's like you got to respect. Did it involve sex or drugs? Drugs. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. even a big drug either. Isn't it weird? I mean, I guess I guess I understand because um, I recognize that I'm abnormally forthcoming with all my shit. Mm -hmm. But but even within that and recognizing I'm on the far end of the spectrum, some things people hold on to. I just can't wrap my head around. Like, like what? Well, like drug use. <laughs> who the fuck cares I, like, I just you know th there'll be people that like don't want to admit they smoke weed I, I'm just confused by it a little bit yeah I get I, it's hard to, sometimes to because we're so open you have uh I think you're definitely re one of the responsible not responsible I mean you're responsible but you're <laughs> one of the reasons why I think I'm more open I, I be I've become more open I think this podcast has caused me to be more open because you start to think I, I, it's almost like I have to be honest. What am I talking about if I'm not, if I can't be honest about everything? And so that, but you definitely, you're just the first time you were on, people would always respond like that was the, your, your interview. Well, don't you find that if you, if you, if you're not going to be honest about stuff, they're just roadblocks in interviewing, right? Because you, you're like, oh, I, I could relate to them right now or I could. You know, I could advance right. this whole thing, but I but I don't want to tell people I've done cocaine. So uh, now I can't advance it because of that. And it just they all end up being little roadblocks along the way, I think. That's right, because I, I, I definitely feel when I start opening up about my anxiety, childhood, anything, I feel like then people are like sort of like, oh, wow, he's he, it, it just sort of like makes things he OK. He burst into flames. Absolutely. What I don't understand, <laughs> though, is something that you have a gift for doing it or maybe just the patience to do it, which surprises me because I, I've seen you impatient, you know, okay, sure. But how well, do you do me directing? So, yeah, well, well, I don't know. You you pretty you were pretty solid when you directed. You, you kept your cool. <laughs> The only thing you ever I know, said, but I'm in a hurry, I guess, is what I'm saying. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very frenetic, fast paced. Yes. But I remember I remember one time we just had this conversation on set. It was on Hit and Run, which I, I love doing. And I, th I think is a great movie, by the way. I do. I, I really love that. I love the part. I love everyone. I love everyone in the movie. It was just a lot of fun. It was this little indie thing. And like 
you were just, you know, you're the lead in it, which I should have learned when I did mine not to do that. That's the hardest <laughs> thing ever. I don't know how we survive, but I remember you sitting there and like, do you trust me? What? Do you trust me? I go, yeah, then, then what are we talking about? Just trust me. You're going to, it's going to be fine. And I remember well, that was a perfect pair because we have kind of the same fears. Like we both, I, well, I'll speak for me. I have a huge authority thing <laughs> just right out of the gates. I cannot stand authority. I Absolutely. think it's because of stepdads that uh, you had stepdads. I don't need some person telling me the game plan. I had enough of that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, right out of the gates. Uh, and I had a lot of adults around me in childhood that had nefarious plans, even if they weren't evil. They just had like self-serving plans that I was the victim of. So, you know, forever uh, going forward, I just I, I'm, I'm a little preoccupied by what's your real intention here? What's your real motivation? What are you really trying to get? You know, right. Let's cut through all the fine tape here. Let's let's just get to where you want to. What are you saying? Because you're beating around the bush here. Is it you don't trust me? Because if it's how you're going to look on film, <laughs> if it's how you're going to, then I want you to trust me. I've got that. And sometimes right. you need that. And sometimes, look, I have, uh, I think the biggest arguments I've ever gotten in my life were authoritative figures. You're right. Uh, directors, yeah. not many. Well, And I bet we remember... Uh, a, I bet we remember different details of that conversation. And then B, I bet we remember different outcomes of that conversation. Because, of course, you and I are just, we're creating a narrative at all times. So mine's very self-serving. So my memory of that, I, I felt like the moment where I got you to click in a little bit was I was <sighs> like, you know, do you want to be in the same movie as everyone else? Because I can tell you like what movie all these people are in. And I'm trying to get you in the same movie. And I do feel a little bit like once I took it away from it, it's not what I want. I'm not trying to control you. Right. I'm just, we, we established some tone in this movie and you can either be in, in, in concert with that, or you can be playing the trumpet on your own. Right. You know, you pick. Yeah. And I think it's sometimes, you know, as an actor, you probably, well, he hired me for the, he hired me. He knows what I could do. I'm just going to go balls out and try a bunch of things. And, but you wanted, you wanted specific specificity. You wanted, yes. and, and by the way, and that's not a word I get out easily or use, uh, <laughs> but it made sense. And sometimes it doesn't make sense until you see things until, and I, you know, when you showed me something, I was like, uh, Oh, like I don't have to do much. Like this is like, it's there. So I, I get it. And it was one of those, it was a great conversation. I think that that needs to happen. I think, uh, but my question really is, first of all, you do three hour interviews. I know. And it's, it's, it's like Rogan does that too. You guys do it. And maybe I, I, for me, I just don't have the patience. I can't talk to people more than an hour. Sometimes well, it's an I'm, hour and I'm a half the spectrum of ADD. <clears throat> let's say we're all somewhere on it. Zero to 10. You're certainly higher on it than I am. Yeah. Yeah. So I wouldn't expect that you, you would be able to just, stay in the zone for three hours yeah that's hard i think even when yeah. you and i did our live show um that was you great. had enough at an hour <laughs> well it's not that i had enough no i'm just like i feel like i have an energy and i bring a sort of energy and i'm like yeah and i'm just excited i'm telling this and that, then i hit a wall somewhere along the line <laughs> yes and again from my point of view that whole day was so funny because we we flew down together and you were being so funny on the plane and you were entertaining all these new people <laughs> which is exactly what i would do it's like all these new people to get approval from yep and like i'm enjoying it and then the, the producer and me occasionally is like above it all going like I don't know Rosenbaum's going to have anything left for the show tonight. <laughs> yeah. This would be an extraordinary output to do twice. And it's a two hour flight. So I basically, you're going to do two, two hour shows. And luckily we found you a hotel room, sent you there to just recoup and recharge. <laughs> I, before the big I passed show. out. <laughs> that flight of, of entertainment. Of course you did. You put on like a, a real show the uh, whole flight. Yeah. And then on the way home, you broke the door down. The cockpit was locked. They couldn't open the door. You kicked it down. You remember that? Didn't, didn't Jay kick it down? Oh, maybe it was Jay. Yeah. Cause it was his plane. Yeah, did maybe I kick it? I, I can't remember. I just remember going, thank God the owner of the plane is here. <laughs> yeah because, yeah exactly otherwise you're like well i hope he doesn't but fuck it that cockpit door needed to be open well we started getting a little claustrophobic yeah i was getting right? worried i, mean, I didn't like it I'm a claustrophobic. yeah i didn't feel well i was hiding <laughs> yeah. it. i was just like 
Uh huh. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, back to that whole thing about authoritative figures. You know, when because you've directed a lot. You know, you directed big movies, you directed small movies, episodes of TV, Parenthood, this and that. But like, when you're on set now as an actor, I know you. I think well enough that when someone else is directing, if you don't really like them, like how they're doing this and how they're moving, I know it probably pisses you off. Like you get really upset. Well, yeah, it does. And, and, uh, I'm aware that I have an oversized reaction to it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I like to think I'm self-aware enough to go, a, I'm not uniquely victimized by this. What, whatever problems this director has, certainly every cast member's experiencing it. Right. So I have to kind of remind myself, like, I'm not uniquely put upon right now. I'm just one of all these people that have to deal with the director. I try to remember that. And then I go, I, I have a uniquely uh, strong reaction to, to being a part of a game plan I don't agree with, you know, from childhood baggage. But, I mean, does yeah. that alleviate the, the, the angst in me? Not a ton. But, but I have learned a little bit to... Um, work around it in that I've learned how to help them know how to talk to me. This is like an Adam Grant guy, Adam Grant, this genius, uh, uh, professor who we've interviewed and not, now I'm a, like a, he's my religion, but at any rate, like you gotta, you gotta give people a, a, an operator manual for you. You can't assume people know your childhood and your triggers and all this shit. So like you do people a real favor by giving them the operator's manual on you. So, so I, I tend to tell the directors like ahead of time, like, you know what would help me is if you tell me what the scene needs, I'll I, I'll help you get what the scene needs. But if you if you start micromanaging what I'm doing, I'm gonna get defensive. I'm just too insecure, and so let me be a part of helping you get what you need out of the scene. Because because what what I think a lot of times what happens is these these arguments between directors and actors. The actor is right. The actor is doing something that would be truthful in the moment. And, and, and you're not going to persuade them or convince them that they're not. But the director has to make the whole thing work. They have to make the whole movie make sense. And a lot of times that involves not doing something that's necessarily truthful in the moment to tell the greater story. So the director's like balancing what would maybe be dead truthful in the moment versus what they have to what the scene has to be to make the next scene work. So if you let me in on the big project, I can probably I'm more apt to like do something that I, I think feels fraudulent in the moment to help you get the big thing for the scene. Have you had uh, directors where they don't want to do that? They're like, this is the way it's doing it. And you can fucking pout about it or get pissed about it. I don't give a shit. And, and have they ever played that uh, card with you? Um, yeah, I, I got to say I'm, I'm generally amen uh, amenable, uh, amenable specificity, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> specificity. Um, you know, obviously it's, a, it's something you would experience way more on, uh, in a movie than on TV. Like on TV, I'm very sympathetic to those directors, man. They come in, everyone knows each other. They've known each other for a couple of years and they got to be the boss and they're the new yeah. group and they're an outsider. It's like, I was, I was said this the other day, like it, it would be like moving to a new school. And when they introduce you to the class, they tell them they you're also the school president. <laughs> like here's <laughs> meet Dax. He just moved here from Milford, Michigan. Right. And he's now the school president. Everyone's going to hate that fucking kid. <laughs> and that is what a, a TV right. director's life is. They come in as an outsider and they're the boss. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you feel like there's certain things that you actually really care about? I try to do this. I try to work as though I care about this and I really want to be an integral part of it. And I want to have a say, and I want to have an opinion. And then there's some things I've done where like, I don't even care. I don't care. Do whatever well, you want to do. Get me out of here so I can go home. I'll, I'll hit well, my marks. I'll say my lines, but I don't really care. It's, it's not worth me getting upset about. Well, increasingly as I've done this longer that I'm of that opinion, most of the time, my, 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 in fact, my agitation with directors, uh, in the last couple of years is almost never about creative. It's, it's all about why are we going to do it this way? It'll take four times as long and we won't accomplish the thing any better than we would if we did it this way. You know, it, that's my frustration generally. But you know just what their like answer a, is? Their answer is always like, well, I'm being creative and I want to do something that I think is, hasn't been seen or that I, that's why I'm doing it. If we do it your way, it's cookie cutter and they're not going to ask me back 
So it's out of a place of fear, perhaps. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm sure it is. But, you know, you have to kind of assess like some people want to be away from their family. And I get it. I mean, especially right now, after two and a half months in a house with my family, I, put me in a 16 hour a day set. I'll be happy as a clam. But in general, I want to go home and see my family. And I understand a lot of people don't want to. Right. And that's where the that that's kind of where it gets into a situation where th there almost appears to be no compromise because you just you want to be at work all day. And I don't. Right. And I don't know how we I don't know how we solve that. So my, my suggestion is like there's some actors here that also don't want to be home. <laughs> <clears throat> you guys go crazy on the days you're with them. Fucking shoot 20 hours. Uh, You know. Yeah. But, but for me, let's let's keep it. Let's keep it lean, mean and, you know tail lights <laughs> seriously you know but by was, the way i've also found that it's not like the quality of my acting's gone down when i was when i was crazy about acting and i thought so much about it and i had to do this thing and they had to let me show you what this would work all that you add up all those performances with the ones where i didn't give a shit i don't think there's a difference and perhaps i'm better when i don't give a shit maybe we had a conversation and i remember it was in a coffee shop in Studio City, and you raised your voice. You weren't yelling, but you were very uh, assertive. You were very. Uh, this was important to you. So I th uh, th <laughs> thus began a uh, a conversation that everyone had to hear. Uh, <laughs> and it was like, well, I don't understand because you you <laughs> you a you came from everyone had to hear. Well, you, well, you came from a, a va I mean, your point was valid. I remember. He said, well, I just like to work. I like to act. I don't care if I'm on a bad show. I don't care if I'm in this. I want to perform. I want to act. I want to work. And we had two yeah. different si sort of ideas. In fact, I think we might have talked about this in, with Monica on the plane. You're Monica. This has come up a bunch between you and I. Yeah, right, it's, because, it's an ongoing yeah. disagreement. And I, I, you know, <laughs> I'm sort of like, maybe it's because I had success with acting at a younger age. Not y well, younger, but... And I kind of burn out and I was just like, I just don't, I want to, I have to love what I'm doing now. Maybe. And maybe all of a sudden you hit your stride. You went from, you know, you were on punked and you did growlings and you all this, but you had to really, we all had to earn it, but you really had to grow and grow in this role and this role. And, and maybe, you know, you, maybe you're starting to get burnt out of it now. You're understanding my point. Well, mm -mm. no, I think for me, I, and and by the way, this this was my point then, and it, it remains my point. And by the way, I'm not judgmental of anyone operating out of ego. I operate on out of ego in so many realms of my life. But I do recognize that me wanting to be on Breaking Bad is my ego because I want people around town to bump into me and say, oh, my God, I love your show, right? And... Uh, and I want to have died having been on these great shows. But but then the, another part of my brain recognizes my children are never going to see Breaking Bad. They're not going to rediscover it. That It goes away. It happened. It goes away. There's no permanence. There's no, it doesn't matter. I'm going to die. And whether or not I leave behind me 700 episodes of amazing TV or 700 episodes of terrible, unwatchable TV there's really no difference in that outcome because no one beyond my life is going to evaluate that. So all my life really will have been is how much fun did I have making the 700 terrible or good or, or, or great episodes and how much did they pay me? Right. I, I think the rest I think is my ego now. And again, I don't mind that. Some, but here's the, like, yes, you like great shows. And my point to you is always like, then watch great shows, <laughs> turn them on, <laughs> enjoy them. You don't have to be in them. <laughs> I, look, I, I agree to a point. I think my approach was, I think your kids will watch them. But it, first of all, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because you're dead. No. It doesn't matter. So look, of course there's ego. I have a lot of ego and fuck, I've worked on it. And we both have. I think for me, it's like, look, A, if I couldn't afford, like if I have a family or if I couldn't afford something, I will do whatever it is. I don't care yeah. if they're doing uh, whatever. I'm not going to bad mouth the show. I mean, I will, but I, I don't, I would do it. I would do whatever it takes to get, have money to provide. But yeah. if I'm lucky enough where I could make those decisions, 
I'd much rather spend my time on a show that has that I'm really proud of. That is actually uh, I stretch. I uh, I'm challenged. Uh, I I'm I'm like I can't wait to tell people to watch this as opposed yeah. to hey I'm on the show that I don't even like. Th- that's well, my point. It, it's a great point. But he, I had this experience over the last couple of years, which was I was on the ranch on Netflix. It has a humongous audience. I've never met a single person in Hollywood that's watched it. Uh, not one. And I know several hundred people in Los Angeles. And not one human being in our industry has watched The Ranch. Now, when I go do a live show around the country, I meet a ton of people that like The Ranch. It has 5 million viewers. Um, so what I'm really doing is I'm elevating the opinion of my peers above the 5 million people that watch the show and enjoy it. First and foremost, right? I've decided I want my peers' approval and not this 5 million people. Because I think it goes without saying, neither of us are talking about a show that has no audience. Then that, That's moot. Yeah, you can't be on a show with no audience. Oh, I've had those shows. So, okay, but they don't last. You, you're not on them for long. Yeah. So my point is, like, if you're on a show that has an audience, now you're talking about what audience are you proud to have? And that's kind of ego because there's no humans more valuable than another. So the 5 million people that love the ranch versus the 5 million people that love the parenthood, the only difference was some of those people that love parenthood were my peers. So it felt better. My ego felt more stroked by the fact that it was my peers as opposed to these other 5 million people. So once I acknowledge there's no hierarchy in who likes it, you know, or it'd be shitty of me to think there's a hierarchy. I then go to, okay, so I probably wouldn't watch The Ranch. None of my peers watch The Ranch. But to your point, if I want to be proud of the work I did, ironically, I had some scenes in The Ranch that I think are the best I've ever had as an actor. Like the final of that show, I actually had the experience. I've had the experience on Parenthood where I'm trying to be emotional. And then I had like the 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 transcended experience on the ranch where it was like I was so emotional. I was trying not to be emotional, which is what would have really happened in that situation. And I was trying not to cry. And I was failing at that. And I've never had that experience. That's truth. Yeah, yeah. I haven't had it on another project. And there were tons of other projects that were maybe, you know, quote, in our industry better. But my personal experience and my personal accomplishment probably peaked on that show that none of my peers will watch. Yeah, no, valid point. I think ultimately, though, at the end of the day, it's not a matter of like the Midwest watching it or Hollywood watching it or whoever watches it. It's And it's not even about you watching it. It's like, do you like working? Do you, if you like the work, for instance, if Ashton well, exactly, wasn't- Exactly, yeah, process. Do you like process? Do I you, like process. Do you like all process? Because I'm not a big fan of all process. I, I don't like, look, I'll do it, maybe, but- you know, people think of Hollywood, they think of it just all glamour. I've had friends come on every set I've ever been on and go, God, man, you're doing that fucking thing again. What the fuck? They've already shot. Oh, it there's before. nothing better than bringing someone to set. It's so exciting for four and a half minutes and they can't <laughs> wait to get the fuck out of it. Exactly. It's so great. Yeah. Everybody. Everybody. Even if it's their favorite show. Doesn't matter. And you bring them after five minutes, they're like, wait. This is so boring. <laughs> yeah, then by the fifth tape, they're going, I don't know if Lex Luthor would say that either. That's kind of, I don't, I don't like your reaction to the last one. Yeah, I didn't ask you. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's, I get, I get it. You like work. I, I like, look, you also worked with Ashton Kutcher, who was one of your close friends. So if Ashton wasn't in it or some other guys weren't in it that you knew, would you have done it? Uh, it's hard to say. I definitely did it because of Ashton and uh, because the pay wasn't there initially. So I wouldn't have done it for the pay. Uh, then, then they did pay me when I came on as a regular, which was nice. But um, look, I, I was in the movie, The Judge, right? Uh, fucking uh, you name them. They're in them. D'Onofrio, uh, fucking uh, Robert Downey Jr. Uh, Great Santini. Uh, what was his name? Robert Duvall. The point is. <laughs> Everyone there's a phenomenal actor. They're all much better actors than I am. Right. The pleasure I had on that set, by the way, I did the same thing on that set, which is I told a bunch of jokes. I tried to make everyone laugh and I got approval and I loved it. And the same thing was happening on the ranch. So the, for me, the experience is almost identical. It's just a place for me to go to try to be entertaining to people. So you like, it's not even the acting as much as it is. How do I entertain people? It's between a, takes. I think you that's and I both I love share the job. that. I think you and I that, both share that. It's exhausting, but that's what we do. Yes. And that's why I love this job. It's a job where you're, you're encouraged to fuck around 
and delay working and be funny and be, you know who else has that job where like you know the the boss is thrilled that you were a fucking goofball the whole day it's the dream well if that if you're saying that then the next time you direct something if you want to pay me a decent amount of money just to come and entertain the the, the crew <laughs> maybe do some stand up in between takes i'd love to do that I can't see me directing anything for another few decades, so I hope you whoa, still whoa. have the stamina in your 60s. Wait, why? <laughs> why don't you want to direct anything? Um, For those things that we talked about, which is I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. Um, directing a movie is two years of your life. You get one paycheck for those two years. It could fucking tank, and or it could be humongous. And I that, that cost-reward analysis doesn't appeal to me as much as it once did well how long do you work on a set how long do you work on um bless this house bless this mess well it was canceled you know that oh i'm sorry i know you enjoyed that it's totally okay um i did enjoy it i really thought the show was really funny i loved it i loved watching it with my kids i loved all the dude the Kechner. cast was out. oh come Kechner, on Kechner, lennon parham uh you know lake uh Bigly. Every, uh, uh, the whole cast was insane it was it was definitely the funniest cast i've been a part of so I loved it, but it was 65 hours a week for seven months of the year. And I have three other jobs. So it, it, just getting the time back definitely softened the blow of, you know, my ego. Right. Having my show canceled. But, for, well, I guess my point is if seven months, 65 hours a week, why couldn't you do a two and a half month movie that's less than half of that you could go back and direct something i know it's a well because i gotta write for a year okay you do that at then home I, then you gotta prep then you gotta shoot for a couple two and a half months then you gotta edit for three months then you gotta test then you gotta go promote it's two years yeah, you're right but i just remember how you know you were good at it not only but you were passionate about it and i knew you had fun doing it and and i just you know i remember the joy you had i mean forget Big whether, time. you know so i there's nothing I like more than production. I There's nothing I enjoy more than directing the movie. Now, the year beforehand, I don't love. It's lonely writing. And then the stress of editing and testing is not fun, I wouldn't say. Uh, you, of course, you get a huge sense of pride as you make it better and better and all those things and you test higher. All that stuff's rewarding. But you know, the fun part of the two years is the two months you're shooting. And again, that, that's a lot of that's a lot of months that aren't fun to have the two fun months. And I, it's not like I, I left directing and went to um, back to detasseling corn. I, I left right. <laughs> directing and I, I'm on a sitcom and I have a podcast and I host Top Gear and I have a game show. Uh, those are all really fun things you know i mean do you think you'll want to act again or, or or like or not not like you know you know direct movies do you think you'll do you i, I know we had this conversation but it, it seems like we both love doing our podcast we both like oh man i i kind of this is this is great i'm fulfilled i have great fans and listeners and I, I enjoy it i feel like i'm making a difference i'm i'm improving as a human being uh you know i guess when does it become enough because i see you do all these things and you're two kids we got what's lincoln's what seven yeah, five and seven. Five and Dakota. Yeah, so I'm like, holy shit, man! You got this family. You got the. It's just you. You do so much, and sometimes I wonder why do these people? Why does my friend do as much as that? Why doesn't he just <laughs> chill the fuck out? Why? What, what, what is it psychologically that you just need to do more and more and more and more? Well, I think there's there's a there's many many reasons why. One, one is. Um, I'll start with the grossest. I'm a, I have a huge fear of financial insecurity. Despite the fact that I have no financial insecurity, it doesn't matter because fears aren't generally reality based. So, you know, I'm from a very modest background and my mom built this business and, and, and money was a big priority in our lives and, and sacrifice for money was what you did. And so, you know, I have a hard time if someone calls me and says, hey, can, you want to make X amount of money in a week? By filming 10 episodes of a game show in a week and i'm gonna say no i think i'm good without that money i can't imagine saying that but so th there's that uh two uh all those things i actually enjoy doing right so it's not like none of them am i on my way there going like oh i gotta fucking do this i, I don't have that feeling so there's there's no downside the only the only real stress is like again bless this mess is so many hours i start going like 
fuck, I don't like that I'm just either waking my girls up and driving them to school or putting them down. I, I don't like having to decide if I only get to do one of those things. I don't love that. I bring my kids to set. It's so fucking boring. I feel terrible for them. Then I regret it. Oh, why did I bring them here? Well, I wanted to see them. Oh, there's nothing for them to do. Uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> that all happens. But uh, there's a uh, strike while the iron's hot mentality. Uh, I just want to stockpile money so I'm not ever... Uh, I, look, you know what I don't want to do? I don't want to be 80, uh, playing a guy who poops his pants in a scene that no one knows their name because I need the money. I could be. I don't want to be in that situation. I'll take that part. I probably will take that part. <laughs> I'll Not, take that fart. Yeah, I'll take that fart. I'll take that chart. <laughs> Inside of you is brought to you by Magic Spoon. You guys, if you haven't tasted this cereal, you're going to have to taste it. Just listen to me. Trust me, because I wouldn't say this, but my friends, I told you, like a few weeks ago, we were sitting around the house, and I brought out some Magic Spoon in the boxes, and all my friends freaked out. I'm not saying that. Ask them. All right, sue me if I'm lying. Ethan, Tom, Joe, Deneen, they all really enjoyed it. And I enjoy it too. And I urge you to get some Magic uh, Spoon. Here's the thing about Magic Spoon. When you're a kid, you eat all these uh, cereals with sugar and crap all in them, right? And you're like, oh, this is great. And you get the, you can't do that as an adult. I was 48 years old. I'll be asleep in 30 minutes after I eat the thing. Ryan? Yeah. I mean, even at 32, I would. Right. Too much sugar, man. It's not good for us. We're getting old. Uh-huh. But breakfast is the, is the best part of every day for me. And um, why can't I enjoy it like I did when I was a kid? I can't. I freaking can. It's Magic Spoon. Let me tell you something. Zero sugar, 11 grams of protein, three net grams of carbs in each morning. You can feel like a kid again. And I like their flavors too. What's right. your favorite? I'm going to go with one well, on the count of three. One, two, three. Frosted. Frosted. <laughs> Dude, seriously? Did you look at my lips when I said it? Did you look at mine? I can't. You're wearing a mask. <laughs> I love Frost, and I also love Coco. That's good, too. Yeah, it's, I mean, I actually like all of them. They're all, they're all really good. Frost and Coco. It tastes you know, good. fruity. Nostalgic, really. And the blueberry is kind of like a boot. Uh, well, I won't, I won't say it. I won't say what it tastes like. I know. Uh, yeah, I really like this stuff. Uh, it's honestly too good to be true. It's keto-friendly. It's gluten-free. It's grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free. I think you guys are going to love it. Please try it. Go to magicspoon.com slash IOU to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use the promo code IOU at checkout to get free shipping. Mm. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, what happens, Ryan? You'll get your money refunded, no questions asked. That's magicspoon.com slash IOU and use the code IOU for free shipping. We thank Magic Spoon for sponsoring our podcast. Distracted driving is a serious problem on our roadways, leading to the deaths of thousands of people and injuries in the hundreds of thousands each year. When you take your eyes and your focus off the road, even for a second, it can be deadly. Not just for you, but for other drivers, pedestrians, and bicyclists. Sadly, many Americans use their cell phones while driving, whether it's texting, checking emails, scrolling media feeds, or any other form of distraction, drivers are putting themselves and others around them at great risk. It's important to know that 48 states ban texting and driving. Also, 21 states prohibit all drivers from using cell phones while driving. Distracted drivers are not only putting people at risk, they're also breaking the law. Look, it's dangerous to use your cell phones behind the wheel. That's why law enforcement officers write tickets and enforce hands-free and anti-texting and driving laws. When you're driving, put down your phone and keep your hands on the wheel, your eyes on the road, and your mind on the task of driving. Remember, you drive, you text, you pay. Brought to you by NHTSA. Yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm probably overly pragmatic about, uh, you know, hopefully it'll be a long ride, and I'm going to need money 40 years from now. <laughs> so you know yeah well it's just amazing to me it's you like, don't have as many financial fears as i do well like, as i, I don't and i have friends. by the way yeah and i know you don't like you know we don't want to talk about money but it's like you have a you're a very successful actor podcaster direct all that Kristen's yeah. a tremendously uh blah 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 you both are very so you have two people that are making money yeah and my agents are always telling me yeah you, you I, I just, I don't know if some of it's fear, some of it's just, I don't want to be, do that. I don't want to, there's a lot of stuff that goes through my head, but listen, listen, I definitely look at my finances every month and go, 
I still mm. do this since I was a kid, since I was uh, no, in New York. And I go, you have $900. You could pay rent for one month. You could eat. Yeah. You could rollerblade to work this week because you work at uh, Emergency Skills Incorporated um, on the phone, telemarketing. You could, And then all of a sudden, then I got money when I was 26. And I go, okay, first season of Smallville. Wow. It went all the way through. Even today, Like you could actually live eight years if you did nothing. Yeah. And I start, that's what I do where I'm like, I don't think about getting more and more and more and more. Like my agent's like, dude, you could do this and this. And I'm like, I just want to be comfortable. I really do. Yeah. I don't, I just want to, the second somebody goes, oh, you have nothing left. I'm like, oh, well, get me, get me a job. Oh, well, here's the great irony. All of it is, is that you, you, you met me right after I had been living for 10 years in LA on eight grand a year. Oh, I yeah. did that for 10 years and I almost never thought about money. <laughs> And then when I got money, I started thinking about money all the time. Like when I had none, it was just like, oh, you got none. You got eight grand a year. You got to pay this rent. You half of six hundred dollars. Bree paid the other half. And then I got to stay drunk five nights a week. That in what's the cheapest way I can do that? And once it was all dialed, it was like it was just on a, a, like auto auto deduction. Like okay, I'm gonna make eight grand, and then I'm gonna spend it on this, and it's all, and I'm gonna save five hundred dollars a year. Like and then it was over. I didn't even think about it. <clears throat> But I do the same thing as you. I'm like, okay, how long can we live? And I have kids and I, the kids got to go to college and the kids, blah, blah, blah. So uh, I just, I work through that scenario. And then all that happens is there's different permutations. Like I go, okay, well, well how long can we live with this lifestyle? Okay. Okay. So what if we scaled it back by this? Then we could live this long, but it's just endless and it's pointless. <laughs> and I recognize it's a racket and there's, it's all faux security. There's no security in life. The fucking this coronavirus came around and just started laughing at everyone. Oh, everyone planned for this. Check this out. Everyone's going to sit in their fucking home for the next three months. Was that in your plan? <laughs> so I recognize it's all an illusion of security, which is not to say that I, I, I'm able to, uh, you know, detach myself from it. I, 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 I still obsess about it. Do you, I guess part of that question was do, i mean do if you, i were you i'd go what how much is enough shepherd <laughs> yeah how much is enough that's what i was thinking because i know that look it's obvious it's not like you know the, obviously you guys have a way more money look, money's not that I mean, look it's i'm just saying like it doesn't matter i'm not gonna go there it doesn't matter okay what i will say is well here's what i can tell you about what's enough okay I know because it's already happened. Whatever number I were to tell you, the day I reach that number, it, there'll be a new number. <laughs> that I know about myself. Okay, no, that's good. I like it. Listen, and by like the when way, you, when you and I were when you and I were eighteen and we lived in the Midwest, yeah, if someone told us we had a million dollars, oh my god, I'm telling you, I would have been like, sweet, I get a fucking uh, a Mastercraft ski boat, I get a '79 Bronco, J. I buy this Penny's house for fucking card, yeah, and then I'm done. By the way, not a million. When I was a kid in Indiana, I go, I make a hundred thousand dollars. I'm leaving this world. Oh, I thought it was a hundred thousand. I thought a hundred thousand dollars would get you. And then you're like, wow, a hundred thousand dollars will last most families. Oh, maybe a year. Yes. Well, in, in, and in my paradigm, the people that made that were the engineers at general motors. So my whole life was automotive. Everyone I knew was somehow in that world. And if you got to like, I don't know, seventh level at GM as an engineer, you could make a hundred grand. So for me, that was virtually the the ceiling of what someone could make. So yeah. And then the second you make that, you know, the million dollars on Smallville, all of a sudden you're friends with some asshole who's making five million dollars a year. And that's part of what drives the insanity is right. You're okay. Now, <laughs> that's good. This is where I'm going. So my question is with all this stuff and all the money and uh, you know, the marriage and the kids and all this, you think. That don't you want a quieter time? Don't you want to be able to, how much time do you really have to spend with your friends? How much time do you really have in general? Because do you miss those times in Michigan? Do you miss those times of just when it was just simpler and you didn't have that much responsibility? And you, it, do you ever think, do you ever uh, reflect? Do you ever, um, what's the word? Uh, Evaluate or revert back to old behaviors or go, oh shit, I'm trying, I'm thinking a certain way like I get used to. I gotta, I gotta correct that. Well, I will say, uh, now I just admitted all that gross stuff about me, how much I think about money and I'm obsessed with it, but I, I will say, I do think I'm pretty, uh, balanced. Like, so I still have tons of hobbies. I still go off roading all the time. I have like a group of friends I ride on the motorcycle track with that I race with there. There's do, I have like sand dune buddies. 
I have um, actor buddies. I, I have I have a big friendship group, and 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 I spend a lot of time with that group. All things considered, the fact that I do have these jobs, and increasingly, as you've pointed out, you know my my calculus to whether or not I want to work on a job is like, what's the bang for the buck? Can I make ten episodes in a week? Yeah, sign me up. Top Gear, I'm on Top Gear. We can shoot an episode in two and a half days. That beats the shit out of being on an HBO show where an episode of Game of Thrones takes 13 days, you know? So that stuff starts becoming part of the analysis. You want to maybe, it's not It's not a bad thing. It's, kind of, it's what I want. I mean, I'd love to feel like I'm doing nothing, but still making a living. <laughs> Sure, I think that's I think that's the that's dream. The goal. We, all, we would I, all like that. Yeah, I mean that's I mean really who wants to who wants to work? But 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 increasingly I'll also say this a big part of the equation now also and this is from like I look up to people like Danny McBride who oh, clearly well. didn't ever prioritize money. He only prioritized working with friends. And mm -hmm. I think he's the big winner in all this. He I is. think there's probably people who make more money, but that like and I think Sandler did that brilliantly. I think the people who recognize okay i'm gonna work that's gonna be very time consuming but i have the ability to spend all that time with friends uh, then you're just you're winning so that's you know like chris and i are gonna do a game show and it's like yeah that won't be a job i'll just be with Kristen, and that's ideal like Hanging out. i'm working with my favorite person and and i'll get paid so you know you said something awesome on a, an interview you said um it was the first time in a relationship or you felt like in your other relationships, you tried to make the person you're dating more like the person you want to date or something like yeah, that. I'm it, paraphrasing. But with yeah, Kristen, yeah. you didn't do that. It was the first time you made a conscious effort not to sort of go there and say, hey, I'm not going to try to mold her into what I want. And I thought that was really interesting because I think I've, I've done 21 that. 21 and older, let an, another N-word molder. That's a Jay-Z line. <laughs> <laughs> but I really, I don't know. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, yes. Um, never, never consciously. I've never like, I'm, uh, I'm not a psychopath. I've never like dated someone and like, I'm going to, I'm going to turn them into the person I want. But slowly I argue with people. They have a position on something. I try to convince them of my way of thinking. And, 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 and I just do that. And then you look at it cumulatively over time and you're like, oh, I think of, I think I was, you know, I think I was trying to get this person to think exactly like me, but why would the fuck would I want to be with someone that thinks exactly like me? Just stay by myself. Exactly. Why am I doing this? Like what, you should be looking to add someone to your life that thinks completely different, that has a different skill set that, that basically doubles your life in its scope and worldview. And, and, you know, I, I had that commitment when I met Kristen in a lot of this stuff for me personally was challenging. I was like, do you believe that Jesus was the son of God and that he rose for our sins? And she said, yes. And I was like, my first thought was, oh, no, I, I want to have kids with this person. Is she going to tell them that they're going to go to hell if they sin? Like I go to all these fears about what her believing in that will, how it'll negatively impact me because I'm a selfish motherfucker and it all is about how it'll impact me. And I just thank God for the first time in my life I had the foresight to go. Don't even touch that. That's great. You think that? Awesome. I'll worry about the kids thing when that arises. Uh, and guess what? Many years later, we had kids, and that's not an issue I even wrestle with. So it would have been a complete waste of my energy and time, and it never even ended up bearing the, the poisonous fruit I was afraid it would. By the way, I just thought, wow, I, I wish everybody would marry someone who's sort of the opposite in thinking or have – because then maybe kids would be more normal. Because if two parents believe one thing, that kid is going to spend the rest of his life saying what mommy and daddy said. I believe what they said, and th that just carries on. But when two people, two, you know, you, Kristen, you know, they could listen to your arguments and make their own decision, ultimately. Yeah, and, and you know, we, we do have a kind of family rule in our house, which is best argument wins. So when we tell them they can't do something or they're, you know, whatever the numerous rules you got to put in place as a parent, which blows, uh, they, they have their day in court. Right. And, and quite often they win. Like if they can make a really salient argument and, and, and it's logic based and it's, it, we will, we will concede defeat if, if they, if they argue well, you know, we, we share the same fear. I, you know, you said, you know, I, I think that you've said this before, but like, 
you always um, imagine yourself as not a very bright person. Obviously, you're very bright, but I've always thought of myself like that. And because of my dysfunction in my life and my family and my history, it's like when someone tells you you're dumb or you're not smart at a young age or you have disabilities or whatever, you believe that no matter what anybody tells you, those developmental years are crucial. And I have felt that. So, I mean, that's a, you know, I don't even know where I was going with that, but I mean, I, I'm just well, even more than the people telling you, which uh, uh, who knows what the effect of that is. But you and I, I think if I know your history correctly, like I got called on in class, <laughs> you know, kindergarten to fifth grade when I had, you know, uh, terrible dyslexia and it was undiagnosed where they call on me. And I'm pretty certain that word says this and I say it out loud and then everyone laughs. And it's not even the other people telling me I'm a dumbass. I I'm learning real time. I'm a dumbass. Like I thought it was that <laughs> word and it's not <laughs> fuck. It's all, it's scary. Cause yeah. you know, I didn't walk around thinking I was like a dumbass or couldn't comprehend the world around me. Yet when you, when you put these letters, these symbols on that chalkboard, I fucking don't know any, I'm the worst in the class. I, and I've said a million times. I, when I get a D or an F in art class and she's like, what, what is this? That's not green. That's a, and I, you know, I'm colorblind and I just, oh, oh, but I don't know anything other than, yeah, I don't know why I don't know this. So I am dumb. Because no one yeah, fails I, art. I'm dumb. In fact, you'd be dumb not to conclude you were dumb. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that would be like the proof you were dumb. R real time. If you didn't recognize you were dumb. Yeah. Uh, that's... I recognized I was dumb, which is dangerous. <laughs> but this is this is what I'm, this is my point. The reason I feel like I have not gotten married, there's a lot of reasons. I'm sure you know most of them. But a big one is I can't imagine teaching my daughter or son math or science or reading with them. And then I'll go back to going, I don't understand this now. I'm really dumb. That really scares me that I can't educate my children the way that they should probably be educated. But can I tell you something? Homework wise. The, the, the best education you could give them is, is relating to them, uh, empathizing with them, sharing in their frustration, saying, I too couldn't learn this. And look, I wasn't dumb. The fucking math, spelling, that's not the thing you need to learn in life. The thing you need to learn in life is resilience, is, you know, it, how to be a good human being. Is, is character. And what you could always educate a kid on is character. And you could always identify and share and let them know you you're you you know how they feel and they're not alone and they're not the first person to have this struggle. That that's what you gotta teach your kid, not fucking algebra. When's the last time you did a quadratic equation? Well, I don't want to get into uh, Pythagorean's <laughs> theorems. Or, a squared uh, plus B squared. Geez, don't always equal C squared. Hey, do you, do you hate, do you hate, I know you talk about this. I'm sure you've asked this, to answer this question. But do you, do you hate being called like sort of America's couple, the perfect couple? Does that make it harder if you, it's got to make it harder if you ever want to get divorced, right? It's like, fuck, now they're all going to think the perfect couple. I mean, do you ever think like oh, that? Oh, well, I, I think I'm very realistic about, if we were to get divorced, America would most certainly side with her. There, there's no, it doesn't matter what the facts would have maybe be. I, I agree. They would probably, Even if yeah. she like, it was, it came out that she was fucking 69 in LeBron James in a Target parking lot. I know people would be like, well, Dak should have 69 her. He must have pushed her to that parking lot. Uh, so I have no illusion that, that America wouldn't side with her. Oh. I've even taken it as far as I probably would be unemployable or maybe they'd let me play villains in movies, you know? Uh, but in general, yeah, I would come out on the business end of that separation. I am not unaware of that. And yet life would go on. <laughs> All the more reason I'll be glad I stockpiled some money. <laughs> that is the best answer you could possibly give. Let's just call a spade a spade. I mean, what yeah, do you like? What do you like? Do you argue about? Is it usually the same thing? Is that you have a certain thing where you're like, you have a trigger, you get mad. She has a trigger, she cries, she gets mad. Is there something that you know you don't go down that path? Oh, there's there's a hundred, and again. You know, the details aren't necessarily relevant. It's all about like the pattern. Like if you can recognize the pattern and then you can just plug anything into that pattern. Uh, she leaves the fucking doors of the cabinets open all the time. She don't even put the lids on her fucking medication. I go to get a nails clipper and I bump something and then there's pills all over. You know, 
it, it does it, the, the the specifics are immaterial it's, it's like what pattern do we endlessly find ourselves in and and how do we divert out of that pattern and what do I you think? do do you calmly sit there i i okay here's i can only tell you my side of the street which is and this is all from aa if we're having a conversation and i notice my breathing changes uh my chest is a little tighter and now my, my volume's gone up a bit, but I don't even realize my volume's gone up a bit. Uh, that I know 100% of the time, whatever the thing is we're debating, whether it's the cabinets or the medicine, uh, I have a fear that's being triggered. Uh, and I need to go into a room and figure out what fear is being triggered. And until I know what fear is being triggered, until I can share with her what fear is being triggered, uh, the rest of the debate's going to be a waste of time. Because I just don't care about things that don't trigger fears in me. There's a million things she does that are are, are objectively offensive as a human. Like a human, <laughs> if a human's throwing something in a trash can, they should make sure it lands in the trash can. And if it doesn't, they should take the time to put it in that trash can. Now, I'll walk into the bathroom and I'll see there's like any number of tissues and some Q-tips and you name it, just around the trash can. It doesn't bother me. I find it you know, objectively wrong, but it doesn't bother me. I'm like, yeah, she, you know what, man, she gets as close as she can and that's enough for her. And then there's some other thing <laughs> that is less objectively offensive that I am off to the races on because it triggered. She cares about work more than me, or she cares about family more than me. She cares about something more than me as I feared my mother did. And that's what's going on. And I need, just need to get vulnerable and tell her, I'm afraid you care about that thing more than me. And she literally goes, honey, I don't care about anything more than you. And then it's over. And I believe her, you know, but I got to get to that point where I can go, I'm afraid you care about that thing more than me. That's incredible. That's incredible that you learn that, that feeling, because I get that feeling and I never know what to do with it. And, I, and first of all, if, I, if you didn't say that, I'd think. Well, this is the feeling I get when I'm upset, when someone's upset me or when I'm just, I'm, I'm unhappy. So there's a trigger here. I don't think, all right, whatever this is, you don't need to go out with it. This is you get you, some, something right then, something, talk to yourself, go in another room because whatever comes out of your mouth probably isn't going to be good. And it's going to come out of a dark place. My favorite example of this, well, I have two. One is you could dedicate the remaining thousand episodes of your podcast to how short Dak Shepard is. That could be, you could even entitle the podcast, Dak Shepard is so short, too short. You could do a thousand episodes. It never bother me because I don't have any fear of being too short. I am objectively tall. I don't have a fear of being too short. So you could spend the rest of your life trying to make fun of me for being short and it wouldn't bother me. Now, if you had a podcast called Dax is self-centered and sucks up too much energy in a room, I'm bothered by that. Cause I, I do do that <laughs> and I have a fear that I do that. And so it would bother me intensely and it would bother you, but you know, they were right. So how, what do you do about that? You try to change yourself or do you say I'm innately that way? Cause I do that. I'm like, I go in a room and whether it's insecurity, I don't think they're going to like me for me. I'll be funny. I'll be this. It's something that I'm not, it's something at a, at a young age I did because I didn't like myself. I wasn't confident with my looks, whatever it was. I did. And now I entertain and people like me. And I'm like, okay, I got him. I got him. Now I can fucking know. Okay. Right. So, so all that is, is an internal job, right? That that's a Michael Rosenbaum job that no one else has anything to do with. Right. You can pretend they do, but they don't. And, and I do think that all of our problems, each individual person on this planet, their problems have nothing to do with anyone else. Those other people just trigger their fears and their insecurities. And then that's the problem. Like if you had, if you're, if your self-esteem was literally a thousand percent, as I'm saying, if, if, if my confidence in every aspect of my personality was the same as my confidence in that I'm not short, I wouldn't have problems because everyone could be saying whatever they were saying and it would never bother me. So all of all that to say, my only problem is Dax and making sure Dax's self-esteem is at its optimal level, as high as it can get. And then I don't have problems anymore. I can't wait for the world to change around me. I have to change me. Inside of you is brought to you by Vincero. These watches are dope. Look at this, Ryan. You never see me in a watch. You know why? No. Because I don't feel comfortable in watches. This one, I actually feel like it's, it just goes with me. It's subtle. 
and it's classy. Can you see that? I really like this watch, and uh, I'm really excited that Vincero is uh, coming on as a sponsor. We are partnering with Vincero Watches. I'm extremely excited about this, and I welcome them to be my sponsor. Making a statement doesn't have to cost a fortune, folks. With Vincero, you can elevate your look for an affordable price. They believe you deserve to look good and feel good no matter your budget. There was that thing on Saturday Night Live, remember? It's better to look good than to feel good. Sometimes that's true. I don't always feel good, so I might as well look good. Vincero creates exceptionally crafted watches, and they do it without breaking the bank, like I said. The guys over there sent us a couple, and uh, I'm wearing it. I'm wearing them, and I'm going to wear the silver one I have. I got this black one. Uh, I'm really excited. And they're stunning. I think I, I thought that'd be five times the price. They're offering you as a listener 15% off your entire order, and they are going to cover all shipping costs. If you visit vincerowatches.com slash Y-O-U, V-I-N-C-E-R-O-W-A-T-C-H-E-S dot com slash Y-O-U. They're honestly, look at this, Ryan. I know, I was going to say, you classed it up today. I know, I was, I was thinking about even wearing pants. I think the watch does the trick, though. The watch helps, you know, it really you does. You pants when you got a watch. Ex yeah, well, who needs pants if you have a watch? <laughs> uh, these are bold watches, sexy looking, um, perfect conversation starter for sure. And that's for, especially for me. People are like, you're wearing a watch? I'm like, yeah, because look at this watch. And as they say, even if you claim not to be a watch person, Vincero has styles for men and women as well as an array of accessories, wallets, bracelets, extra straps, sunglasses, all made with the same incredible quality as their watches. And that is why they have over 23,000 five-star reviews on their website, and you can go and read them for yourself. Yeah, and they're offering free shipping, free returns for 30 days, and a warranty on your watch for up to two years. That is pretty wild. It is really stress-free shopping right at home. It's so easy. So, guys, don't overpay for a watch that looks cheap and disappoints. Exclusively for our listeners, Vincero is giving you 15% off their already affordable watches. Go to VinceroWatches.com backslash Y-O-U. Don't you dare pay full price at checkout. Go to my link and code Y-O-U will be auto-applied at checkout. It is that easy. This is a buy you won't regret. By the way, I'm not kidding that once I, I just, I, I could go forever. I'm not going to, but like I, this is, this is easy for me. I forget how easy it is to talk to you and be so open. And uh, I just, I, I, you know, I always reminisce. I always think about, you know, all the things we, we used to do. And I, I'm sort of one of those people that, you know, I'm definitely one foot in the past, one foot in the future and pissing on the present. I, I'm always been like that. And like, I'm just, I'm like, I remember I almost it brought me to tears. I heard an 80s song yesterday. And I remember, I would not, I'm saying this out loud, but I remember I got a tear in my eye and go, God, I just, how, how do I get back? <laughs> I know, I know. You know I, I really, I really thought, with... I want, I got, God, how could I, I mean, if there is a heaven, I think there is. I, I hope that when you die, that subconsciously, whatever it is that you love, maybe you don't even know how much you love it till you die and you're there. That, it, that, that whatever that is, you die and the, 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 all that shit's released in your brain. What's that called? DMT? What the shit's that called? <laughs> the God drug? Whatever it is. That, yeah, well, whatever it is, it's in your brain. It releases when you die. I'll send you an article. But anyway, uh -huh. when you die, you go to a place, you're like, yeah, I'm walking down Landview Drive to Danny Cutter's house and his brother's <laughs> got an El Camino and fucking Van Halen jumps playing. And I'm going to go downstairs <laughs> in the basement and play Atari Pac-Man and the, the fuck that it's raining and then there's a tornado and Shotzi and Cricket are kind of taking it almost blowing away and the fucking winds are almost like lifting the dogs up and Ron the brothers grabbing them and I'm like I don't know what it is simpler times moments because not all of my childhood was brilliant but I I miss a certain just innocence of like God I didn't think about work so much all I thought about was how do I just enjoy? How do I just be in this moment? You didn't think about well, it. But, but what's ironic, uh, it, it appears to me what's appealing about that phase of your life is that you actually were present. Like the thing that you're nostalgic for, the feeling, it's not about Van Halen. It's not about all those details. Your emotional state, it sounds like, was present, was like yeah. in the time you were in. You were occupying the, t the slice of time and space that you were in. You weren't trying to get somewhere. You didn't have aspirations yet. You weren't evaluating yourself yet against all these other people who had similar aspirations and where they're at. And what you really miss is a contentment and a presence. And so the irony being, of course, is that 
you, you're leaving the present today t- to want to be there. And so it's like for you to be there would be to stop wanting to be there. You could be there again. You could walk out your fucking driveway right now and go, God damn, I live on this street. I bought this place. I can take a stroll. No one can say I can't if I want to walk all the way down the hill and get a fucking Slurpee. I can do it. Uh, I could stop at fucking uh, your buddy's house. Life's too short not to hit your pool, buddy. Oh, you Harlan. Know, yeah, Harlan. I mean, you could choose to be doing the exact thing in 1986 you love. But there wasn't that feeling, and maybe there is. There wasn't that feeling of like, I got to make money. I got to do this. I got to impress. I got to fucking take care of that. There was just like, I just got to be home by six and eat some shitty dinner that my mom's creating and then go upstairs and pretend like, I'm, and then watch the thing on TV that's playing. I didn't, there wasn't, there, there is that. And there's always like, there's the, still that little kid that's going, fuck man. All right. I, I want to be grown up. I'm responsible. I don't do drugs. I, I try to, I'm a good person for the most part. I try to be. And then there's just like, ah, and then you start to go back and forth. Like, how much do I really love this? How much do I really do I like myself? How much? Do I, there's all that that always kind of catches up with you. Yeah, but I, so, I think what you suffer from um, disproportionately <laughs> is I think the weight of some trajectory in your mind you're supposed to be on uh, is, is, is a lot, is cumbersome for you. And by the way, I haven't, I've certainly spent most of my working life not being this way. But I have to say, um, I've really transitioned into comparing myself to previous versions of myself and no one else. And I have found elation in that. I, I, you know what? Right when you said that, it made me think. And I definitely like myself better than I did a year ago or six months, maybe even than yesterday. But but That's, that doesn't. It's look. I'm on the right path. I think we all are. I think if we just like learned, you know, it's it, it may sound like a stupid question, but it's like you know that question when people say, "Do you love yourself?" That's always bothered me. And I've asked it every once in a while, not much, but like you know, that's a. You should either love yourself. You should know the answer immediately, shouldn't you? Hmm. I'm guessing. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if you should know it immediately. I think. What would be really relevant is what things uh, you because I don't think you can think your way into feeling differently. I think you have to act your way into feeling differently. Yeah, so sure. I think if I ask you right now, Rosenbaum, what's the five things on your list that give you self-esteem? What are they? Uh, I like when people uh, email the show or I read fan letters or I bump into someone or on my Patreon. Some. And someone says your your podcast changed my life. It um, mm-hmm. you know listening to you talk about anxiety with the people that you know it helps normal whatever that does give me like a reason like hey I'm I'm doing something right that's great mm-hmm. but you know also self esteem sure when you're when you have more listeners when you have more uh, sponsors when you have more a lot of things that of course aren't that important but of course they feed that self esteem but I I really try to go hey I don't need to make an exorbitant amount of money. I just want to do something I love and, and, and make a living at it. That's what everyone wants to do. It, that's a tough question because yeah, there are things uh, self-esteem wise that we do when someone says, Oh, you're, I don't need to hear but I'm I, handsome. I, guess my, I don't my need point to hear that. I, I think if someone doesn't have a list of, if they don't know the things that give them self-esteem, how on earth could they be working on their self-esteem? Mm-hmm. So, you know, for me, mine is exercise. When I exercise, it raises my self-esteem. I'm proud of myself. I did something that I didn't enjoy doing for the betterment of myself long term. Uh, if I eat healthy, that gives me self-esteem. Because again, I, I I rejected something that was tempting uh, for my betterment. Um, I'm a of a service to people. I don't want to fucking call people in AA. I don't want to take someone through the steps. I don't want to do any of that shit. I don't want to fucking host a meeting at my house. But when I do something for other people. I feel I like myself more. That's, I can answer that question. Absolutely. I love myself. And so, you know, there, there's one needs to know what things result in self-esteem because they're not going to magically arrive at it. You know what? One thing that came to mind is when I do things where I don't think about what 
whether it's, oh, well, what do you get from that? Or, oh, if you do that, you know, this will, you know, people will see. It's altruism. It's when the other day I was on my phone and it says, I won't, you know, it said on Twitter, I don't know, whatever. It said uh, a kid uh, graduates and on his drive home, his, uh, well, him and his sister in the back seat, his parents are killed in a crash on his graduation day. That's most exciting. And immediately I, I, di- I didn't wait a, wait a bit. I, ju- I didn't think of anything other than I have to f- contact the school. I have to find a way to somehow help or donate or whatever. I didn't say who I was or not that that matters, but I just... I found the school and I, and I wrote and I genuinely did it from a place of just love. And and it almost made me emotional that I was doing this because it felt good and it felt like I had to do that. Yes. And and so, and I think you and I share this, even though I'm not, I'm not willing to say you're an addict. I know nothing about that, but what I will say is Mm. in, in AA, uh, even that altruism is selfish, which is totally okay. In my opinion, so I, I am of I believe that the source of almost all my anxiety and depression and all that stuff is thinking about myself. If you give me time to think about myself, I will inevitably start wondering where I'm ranking in this world and I'll start comparing myself to other people and I'll start thinking of the things that Dax doesn't have that he should have. And the more time I spend thinking about myself, the less happy I am. Maybe that's why so, you do. Maybe that's why you're so busy. I think that's probably part of the thing. But I, I know from service in AA, it's pretty hard to be thinking about what I do or don't have while I'm helping someone else. I just get kind of sucked into their problem or sucked into their thing. And it just it frees me from thinking of myself. And, and so, you know, one of the things with you is like, I don't think it's right or wrong to be in a relationship or be married. I don't give a fuck. I have no position on that. What I have a position on it, the way I think it could be hugely beneficial to you is simply you're going to have to spend so much goddamn time thinking about the other person and and the compromise that you guys have to come to that it it, kind of it takes away some of the free time to (laughs) obsess about yourself and the things you need and where you're at. And so it's like, fuck all the other stuff. It's just like. Get some, fill up that dance card with other people's problems. And inevitably you have less time to think about yours. And really you don't have fucking problems because you're full and there's a roof over your head. Everything else sure. is just abstract, right? All right. This is it. This is the, all right, I got my patrons, my top patrons ask questions and you just you oh, spitfire. Okay, this is a uh, Dak Shepard shit talking questions. Answer them as quickly as you want. Leanne, since both Dax and his wife are successful act- actors, is it difficult to find a, uh, a work home balance. Uh, it's really not. We, I don't know why it's almost enough to make me believe in a higher power. Uh, I get busy. She gets time. Then she gets busy and I get time. It's been freaky since we've had kids. Generally our very busy times have kept dosy doing. Jennifer Ann, would you do a horror film? If yes, with who? What one did I say? Well, like you think about a get out or something. You, I'd kill to be in that movie, right? Would you want to be get the out? killer or someone I, who's racing from the killer? I was just thinking of this for Kristen and I yesterday because we're both now without scripted television shows. And I was like, wouldn't it be fun to maybe play on the, if I was a cynic, well, I am a cynic. If I was in America looking at Kristen and I, I'd go, fuck that. Bullshit. He's probably gay. She's probably blank. She's a junkie. There's no way this is real. So maybe I would love to do a horror movie where we're like maybe like an on-aired married newscast team or something. And then when we're off work, we're just fucking evil. <laughs> um, you know what? That'd be funny because it plays on the whole thing where, oh, Dax and Chris and America's couple, they're cute, they're sweet. And then all of a sudden like, fuck you. And you're just stabbing <laughs> I knew were, people. I knew they were evil. I yeah, knew yeah. they were fucks. <laughs> And then you'll yeah. have <laughs> Matthew. If you were to make another big studio produced film, I ma- imagine the challenges of working with large studios like that are daunting. That's not really a question. I had a great studio experience on chips. I, I, th- I thought it was great. And to have like the, the infrastructure that exists there. Uh, I just remember like day one on chips going like, oh my God, if I had had this shit on hit and run, I mean, man, does it make it easy? A fucking... Porsche Cayenne with a Russian arm on top and best driver in the world driving and the fucking guy who shot all of uh, the, the fucking uh, 
bad boys action sequences as my DP. Are you kidding? Like this boy, this makes it easier. You said something awesome. Like in our last interview, you said something because, uh, you know, we we're talking about it and you're like, well, you know, chips didn't have a big box office success or whatever. And you go, but if I went back to that, I don't know, that 13 year old kid in Michigan, <laughs> or Detroit and said, Hey, little Dax, Hey, would you want to be in a big movie? Want to be a movie star? Want to be in a big motion picture and you get to direct it? That and ride motorcycles the whole time. Yeah. Well, that kid wouldn't go. Well, does it make a lot of money? Is it become yeah, a how huge? Much it, how much did it make? Is it a huge success? I mean, that's what we lose. I think that was the most profound thing I've, I've heard you say, or one of them, because that just puts everything in a brand new perspective. Like, do it because you love it. And if it has success, great. It's hard to yeah, differentiate yeah, those things. Yeah, it really is. I mean, you, look, you can't be naive. Like the, the success of those things determines whether or not you'll get to do it again. So it is relevant. Right. But yes, as a life experience, whether that thing, the life experience was a life experience. Now it could have made 500 million or in its case, it made 28 million or whatever. Uh, the experience was the experience. The other thing was just the results of which I don't control. Right. It really sucks if you had a shitty experience and it bombed. But if oh, you had a great experience and it bombed, <laughs> it's not that bad. Or a great experience and it had, oh my God. But yeah, I got you. Claudine. Or I always wonder, I always wonder, because this is the thing I, I did think about. Like, say the devil comes down and he says, now you could either love the movie you made and it makes 28 million, or you could totally have missed the mark of what you were trying to make, but it's a huge success. I, I don't think I would choose the latter. I don't think I would want to have not made the movie i set out to, to to get the reward of it you know well the only thing i would say there is if the movie made so much money that then you're given another opportunity to do what you want again and make it better but wouldn't you be so fear laden because you're like well the thing i made last time didn't even turn out to what i tried to make <laughs> so if i try again i can't get that lucky twice i just wanted to survive i just didn't want to die during the making of my movie that's all <laughs> i remember praying to god and day like 15 i go Hey, if you just get me out of this, I don't, uh, I'll, I'll never direct again. Just, uh, I remember sitting in the back seat. I've told this story of Tom and Deneen, who, you know, my best friends. They're, they're taking you to the hospital, right? Well, no, I, I didn't, but we're driving and it's like five in the morning, six in the morning. And I'm in the back seat and Deneen's like, oh, Chipper going, ah, so anyway, blah, blah, it's going to be a great day. Blah, blah, blah. And Tom's like, uh-huh. And I'm in the back seat in the middle and I just go, I think I need to go to the hospital. <laughs> and I, I it was I barely audible. To. And Deneen goes, what? I go, I need to go to the hospital. And then she goes, ah, it's going to be a great day. She didn't look at me, but if she would have turned around, we would have gone to the hospital. Cla Claudine, a question for Dax. Well, I would hope so. What's something he's learned about himself since becoming a dad? Mm. Mm, that's a good one. I want to give a good, I want to, like, there's some things that are popping up, but I think. Life lesson wise, you know, you know, I, I know what it is. It's, um, I think most of my life I've had the, uh, the agenda to get my way <laughs> and, and uh, I've been trying to be more clever and, and more tactful or, or tactical and, and getting my way. And when you have kids, especially if you have two, you know, our first one was so fucking easy. Uh, the way I would naturally parent was yielding results. I thought we were geniuses that we should write a book about it. And then we had another kid and just uh, the opposite things worked for that kid. But I, I spent a few years, uh, being stubborn and trying to parent her the same way as our firstborn. And all of a sudden I just had this terrible realization. I was like, Oh, I think I wrote my own father off at about five years old. I was like, okay, it's your way or the highway. I picked the highway motherfucker. And I just had this moment where I was like, oh, they could pick the highway. Like I could, I could get my, I could win and lose so big. And I gotta, I gotta flip this thing. Wow. So I just think having the experience of like prioritizing what you should pro what I should have always prioritized in life, which is like, well, there's another human involved and maybe I, I need to care as much about them getting what they want out of this experience. Todd, uh, everyone geeks out on something. I can answer this. What do you geek out on besides cars and besides motorcycles cars? and motorcycles and your kids or your wife? What do you geek out on? Might not Michael McDonald. This is you a can't dark, say that either. This is a dark one. Chris, Kristen hates this. Um, I'm obsessed. They're largely criminals. I'm obsessed with people 
who through a, a force of will did something impossible. My, my prime example of it is uh, Pablo Escobar. He is a poor kid living on the streets of Medellin. He has no shot at becoming the eighth richest man in the world. That, that's off the table. He didn't invent Microsoft. And just through his own will, he's like, no, I'm going to become the eighth richest man in the world. I'm a tr I'm somehow attract. I'm obsessed with these stories where people just, and they're often delusional. And through that delusion and their, their force of will, they, they do something impossible. I, I find that endlessly interesting. Emily asks. Do you like that stuff? Do you like criminal shit? Yeah, I watch a lot of Dateline. Um, I know we both love, what's his name? It was Ken, in October. Uh, Ken, 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 Keith Morrison. December. Oh, October is whatever. Yeah, that guy. It Keith was Morrison. a hot red moon under a nice cold night. And his, <laughs> dude, he's hilarious. And what's he's his name? Greatest. Hater, who does him on SNL, used to do him. Oh, so good. Oh, so good. He's hard to do. I can't, I can't even get close to him. You had him on your show, too. Oh, I got oh. Todd, and he's so beautifully Canadian. He just he kept going. It feels so self indulgent to talk about myself. I don't know I'm why like, yeah, I want to do. I'm this. like, but people want to know about you. Why do I want to do this? <laughs> Emily, who's your favorite guest on interview uh, to interview an uh, arm armchair expert? I have to give a couple answers. One, obviously, my mother is my favorite interview by far. Um, but I, if we if we take out that that obvious advantage she has. Um, I think dog, the, the bounty hunter, maybe. D dog wow. or Monica Lewinsky. All right. Just like when you get something so unexpected, like I could have, I could have held Dwayne in my arms after the interview for about an hour and a half. I think before it would have felt awkward. I just wanted, I was so shocked with what a beautiful guy he was. What a sweetheart. It was so lovely. A Angel, two more questions. Since you guys have been friends for a long time, uh, share a funny Dax Rosie story. What what story do you think of that we could actually tell? Well, look, when you you and I met when we were younger, and yeah. uh, we're both insecure about how we look, but we both like our penises a lot. So we were you and I constantly had those swords out all over town. Yeah. You know, when I look back on it, we're we're pretty lucky. Times have changed. We wouldn't do that now. Yeah. Uh, but we lived in maybe the last era where you could get that sword out a lot. Yeah, and I don't, you know, and, and not, we did. And I, and I really, it never was creepy or weird. I mean, it's weird to just do it in general. But <laughs> no, what I'm saying is we weren't going, doing things like, it was just two like little boys going, hey, check this out, Dax. Hey, check out my cap. Hey, check it. It was just like, we didn't go. <laughs> my <really> cap. <laughs> <laughs> Look, yeah, it was a long time ago, and uh, yeah. But I think to have known Rosenbaum and I in that that era is to have seen us with our pants down. I think probably that could have yeah. that could have happened. Bob, <laughs> idiocracy. In your opinion, are we already there? <laughs> uh, no, you know, I um, Stephen Pinker. He he's a he's a a genius. He he he's written a lot of books. Uh, his most recent one is a, a, is about the Enlightenment, like maybe pursuing the ideals of the Enlightenment. I am of the opinion that although in the present day, sometimes it looks like we're going backwards, I think if you look at the long arc, of this human experience, we're getting better and better and better, less and less people starve. I think it's good. I think in the short term, it sometimes looks discouraging, but I think it's a really new experiment. And I think we're doing a good job at getting better and better. Uh, this has been awesome. I, I wanted to end this. Actually, I wanted to start this with just. Do we pull our dongs out? Uh, for not each anymore. Other on Zoom? That was uh, that was uh, twenty years ago. We shouldn't do that anymore. <laughs> but I will say, you know, occasionally when my friend Rob or somebody comes over, you know, they might just I'm like, hey Rob, do you want anything to drink? And they'll turn around. I'm like, I'm naked. Just to just <laughs> as a just a semblance, you know, just a just a little nostalgia. Because like, come on, dude, it's just harmless. It's a, it's a dong. We're naked. Well, you and I find. Look, here's here's where I, I should I should say this because it is relevant. You and I find that really funny. We both enjoy it, and and and, and we're f we have the privilege of finding it funny. What I've realized over time is like, yeah, of course that's funny because I'm a tall white dude, and I don't feel threatened a lot by penises. Um, so it's a privilege that I can find it humorous. Um, if I were a woman, it wouldn't be so funny. And if I were, you know, any number of people, I'm, I'm the right. most empowered someone could be in our society. So, yeah, I, I think a lot of things are funny that are scary to other people. Sure.
But I, I think yeah. that, you know, if I recall, I, I just remember it was usually you and I or other guys around for the, for the most part. Yeah, you know but, what I mean? but if you had this, I've had this experience on a set where it's like you're nude with an actress and I'm trapped in my own experience and I'm kind of like, oh, but no big deal. I'm, I'm nude. But then I have to, you know, I have to recognize, well, yeah, 85% of the crew is dudes. No one's going to go home and jerk off thinking about me. No one's going to, you know, there's all these creepy, I'm not sure. dealing with the same thing that the actress is. Right. Absolutely. It's, I, it's different. I hear you. And it's just, a, it's just being aware, it's being aware and going, okay, I'm not this person. I'm not, I don't feel threatened. You're right. I remember one time on Smallville, it was one of the finales of the season and they had me up on the, in the front, up at Whistler in the middle of nowhere, but we we're staying at this hotel and everybody got to change there, you know, just go, go a big, like a big suite. And, uh -huh. I, and I walked in and one of the crew guys is there and I'm like, Hey, I'm going to take a shower. Is there anybody else here? He's like, Oh, Barry, Barry's uh, you know, he's in the shower. And I go, Oh, perfect. He's like this, you know, at that time he's 25 <laughs> years older than me. He's an older guy. Uh -huh. And I love Barry. He's my buddy. So the yeah. first thing I thought I was like, oh, I got to do something. Sure. You know? Sure. So I uh, <laughs> took off all my clothes and uh, he, I waited till he was lathered up really good. And he was an Irish fella. And I remember just going in there and I go, could you pass the Irish spring there, Barry? And he's like, Jesus Christ, Rosenbaum, what the fuck? <laughs> and then uh, he started laughing. And then he, we, you know, we both Oof. told the whole crew and everybody It just went on forever. And it was just like, you can't do that anymore. But of course, my whole thought was like, how do I make people laugh? How do I be funny? Right. That, right it was always right. out of a place of that. It was never out of a place where like, hey, I want someone to see my D. Yeah. Uh, I was going to end this. We talk about this. I have, I got autographs, you know, that I have a house full of like posters and things. You've never been, we've, and you can listen to the Toys. last conversation. You say it's a waste. Yeah. So I, I did something I want to show it to you, but um, you know, one of my favorite movies is the Warriors, the gang movie. Absolutely. Right. So for Warriors come, come out, out and play. play. Warriors are good, real good, <laughs> the best, <laughs> but the rest is ours. Anyway, it was Cyrus. You see, which what does he say? He's like, hey, twenty thousand cops in this city. Can you dig it? Can, Can you, you dig it? I loved it. Love it. So I was we got the Bayside Rollers sitting next to the Van I forget the names Rangers. of the games. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. So I'm a huge fan. Obviously, you are too. A lot of people are. Walter and, Hill. Walter Hill. I'm trying to get him on the podcast. Sure. My buddy's friends with him. I just love to talk. To, he's probably going, oh, another guy who wants to talk about the Warriors. Great. <laughs> but he did a lot of other great movies. Anyway, so for I'm not kidding. Since the late 90s, I've been looking for a, an original Warriors vest, something that was worn by the Warriors. And it was impossible. The, 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 the brown leather. Right. On, yeah. I think, yeah. And I had looked and I gave up because I was like, I heard that someone had one, but the cast never really kept the originals and they were locked away and there was only this. They had some doubles. So I was telling my friend and I just said, man, I'll tell you, if a warrior's vest ever comes up, I will. I'll pay two grand for that thing. <laughs> and I go, you know what? Fuck it. And I looked on my phone and on eBay. Original warrior's vest worn by David Harris, who pl played Cochise, the one with the big bandana. Black guy, oh, yeah. awesome. Yeah, you'll know yeah. him when you see him. And it had a picture of him. It was authentic. Ooh. And I just said, "Are you kidding me?" And I just messaged the guy back, and I go, "I'll give you a thousand. <laughs> I wasn't gonna go over the two. I would, I would have paid two, but he's, you know, I just said, let's you got see, it for a grand. Let's see what he says. He goes, "Sure, I'll take a thousand. That sounds like a bargain. Oh, dude. Now, this is the first piece of memorabilia you own that I'm thrilled with. Really? Oh, that is Nate Tuck would fucking cream his jean if he saw this. In fact, will you take a nice photograph of it and send it to me so I can send it to Nate? Oh, yeah. You should actually look on my Instagram. I posted a video of me wearing the vest. Does it fit well? Oh, yeah. It fits really like well. A, I got to work out a little more. I'll be honest with you. Yeah. The yeah. Warriors were in shape for the most part. Do you remember that, that the, the gang? Though? There were a couple of them that you're like, this guy couldn't beat the shit out of a piece of shit. Well, you know, it's so interesting what our memories of things are versus like, do you remember in Urban Cowboy? Great film. Oh, yeah. You, you, yeah. Love. The antagonist. I forget that guy's name. Glenn. Uh, Wasn't it Scott uh, Glenn? Scott Glenn. Now, I was telling Kristen about Scott Glenn's biceps in that movie. And in my mind, my, in my memory, 
they're fucking enormous. Ripped. Like I never saw biceps like that. <laughs> I go, I look on, I look, you know, Google images and they're nice, man. They're nice biceps. But they're not they're, what you thought. He's, he's cut and he has a really nice vein, but they're not at all what I thought. And, 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 and the bar has raised so much, you yeah. know, with these superhero movies and everything. You now realize like, oh, they were pretty average looking guys <laughs> that I was crazy for. Oh, yeah. Well, that's like with anything. I think I just watched. I loved Gremlins as a kid and I put it on. And within 20 minutes, I go, can we turn this off, guys? Like, no, no, what are you talking about? I'm like, this doesn't hold up at all. What a piece oh, of shit. Interesting. I still watch it every Christmas. I, I like it. I, I just, it was just it was so, I couldn't, I, yeah, I can't get into it. You couldn't it. do it. Couldn't and, do but it. yeah, and as much as I like horror, after Friday the 13th one or a Halloween one, I'm out. Can't do it. There's nothing scary about a guy who can't be killed. He just can't be killed. At least there's like, it's just like everyone's going to die. But if you could, yeah. if you could stop the paranormal thing, or you could stop the zombies, or you could stop something, there's fear, and you got, you know, at the end they could still win. Yeah, that's my logic. You have a real um, emotional attachment to to horror. Yeah, yeah. I love it. <laughs> Do you? Uh, almost none. It, it never. It was a genre that never really appealed to me. I can name the five horror movies I've ever liked. Let me guess: you know? The Thing, The Shining. I don't know. Oh, Shining's great. Exorcist. Yeah, yeah. Nah. What is it? Uh, Freddy Krueger, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Love that one. Love Get Out. And that might be it. Wow. <laughs> you know, one day when it's all over, I'd love to, we, I want to hang out, but it wouldn't be bad to like, I, I want to try and scare you with the movie that I think is the, the scariest movie or one of the scariest movies and see how you feel watching it. Just sitting back with me. You know, that's just the thing. I don't, um, I just don't get scared. I, I, anytime maybe that I maybe be going down that road, I remind myself that it's a movie, which is terrible. I wish I could just enjoy it, but I, I've never g been able to get terrified by a movie. All right. Leave me with this. Leave me with uh, a little, uh, Michael McDonald for me. Now I know what love in you calls babe. Now we're up to talk in divorce and we weren't even married. On my own <laughs> how it was supposed to be. <laughs> I could do it forever. It's so lackluster. All my impressions get worse and worse no, every year. Great. Your yeah. own Wilson's the best. <laughs> It was, it was. It's, it's, hey, I, I love you. This is this is a lot of fun, man. I'm glad we got to catch up, and I and I do miss you. And uh, when this is all over, we got we got to do something. Fuck yeah, brother! Can we do that? I don't have a TV show anymore. I'm I'm set. I can party. Wait a minute! Didn't you say you had another TV show? Or you just yeah, have I mean, some other TV shows, but I don't have the big the big one. The time the time killer. All right, I like it. Hey, congrats, everybody! Listen to Armchair Expert. It's uh, huge and awesome, and uh, he gets amazing guests, and uh, you're an amazing guest. So thanks, dude. <laughs> Thank you. I love you, Rosie. Love you too, buddy. I really enjoy having Dax on the show. Um, I do. And uh, he's always honest, and I feel like I could ask him anything. He's one of those guests where you could just say something, and he'll, you know, yeah, but, well, you know. Um, <laughs> I always felt, you know, I, I think I get sometimes annoyed. We get annoyed with each other because I definitely feel like sometimes he's, a, you know, he could sort of be that therapy. He's been through so much therapy. I've been through therapy, but he'll. He'll point things out. I mean, I go, I know this about myself. You don't have to tell me. And that's not what, and I get defensive. I'm like, eh, there's probably some truth there. <laughs> uh, it's always an enjoyable time. And I thank him for coming on the podcast again. So that was really nice. Thank you all again for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And please, if you enjoyed Dax, please stick around for the next episode and support the show. Thank you, Westwood One and all the ladies, um, Agnes and Teresa and Katrin and uh, and you know Kelly, of course, uh, all you guys over at Westwood One, and everybody helping Lou, and thank you Ryan, thank you Bryce for making the show better and better. And again, at Inside You Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, at Inside You Pod on the Twitter, and all that. Be good to yourselves, stay strong. I'm gonna do a little uh, patron shout out to all my patrons who really go above and beyond and uh, give me all the support and the love. And again, Team Rogue Flask and uh, Leah and Kristen, thank you for the stage it before i do that also the online store inside of you online store we got the wine glasses and the mugs and the hats and the we got horror hats too i have these awesome i love horror which is true so and look at this somebody look they gave me this cup lee and a bunch of people and mary and it's really nice oh it's just nice isn't that nice when people make you things yeah it's really nice 
I don't make people things. No, I do. I give them things. Patron shout out. Here we go. Nancy D, Mary B, Leah S, Trisha F, Sarah V, Little Lisa. Little Lisa, you keep go. Jill E, Brian H, Lauren G. You know these people by now, don't you? You've heard mm-hmm. the names so many times. Mm-hmm. Nico P, Angelina G, Robin S, Jerry W, Emily F, Bob B, Robert I, Jason W, Stephen J, Kristen K, Amelia O, Allison L, Tom N, Jess J, Lucas M, Raj, Emily S, CJ P, Samantha M, Hamza B, Jennifer N, Jackie uh, P, Jackie P, Stacy L, Carly H, Jennifer S, Janelle B, Carrie B, Tabitha 272, not to be confused with. Tabitha 273. Kimberly E, Crystal H, Mike E, Marissa <laughs> N, Ramira, Beth B, Santiago M, Sarah F, Chad W, Leon P, Rachel C, Russian R, Ray A, Maya P, Megan J, Jennifer C, Maddie S, Tiffany I, almost there, guys. Kendrick F, Ashley E, Margie M, Thomas T, Matt W, Belinda N, Benjamin R, Lisa J, Kevin V, Robert S, Mike W, James R, Chris H, Snow R, Noah K, Sean V, Anusha W, Ashbourne, 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 H, and Dave H, and Sheila G. You guys are terrific. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast again, and, uh, Let's keep it going, man. Let's keep having fun. Keep tuning in and uh, write in. You know, I always I have to re- read some letters again. I haven't done that in a while. Yeah. So I'll have to read some letters. I'm going to have to go to the uh, hello at inside of you podcast.com and get some interesting letters. Try to make them short if you can. That'd be great. I'm not. I have ADD. Yeah. All right. Thank you for allowing me to be inside of each and every one of you. Ryan. Michael. We'll do it again. Mm-hmm. All right. See you next week. Mm-hmm.